So, in April 2017, that just recently passed, William Shatner, who's better known as Captain Kirk, from the original Star Trek series, tweeted in support of the Autism Awareness Month. So knowingly or possibly unknowingly, William Shatner was unaware of the controversy of Autism Speaks. So many in the autism community say that Autism Speaks is anti-autism. Others point to promotion of past deeds they've had were were anti-vax ideals. And this was politely pointed out to William Shatner. And this all happened on Twitter. So you know what happened next, right? Shatner doubled down and was attacked and returned. And it got real ugly real quick. So David Gorski, who is a member of the uh, skeptic community, he writes for science-based medicine. He is an oncologist. And he writes under the name ORAC but he gets a lot of flack for writing about vaccine awareness and lots of stuff he does, but it's all usually medicine related. So he tried very nicely to explain to William Shatner the controversy that the autism community has with Autism Speaks, the group. So Shatner decided to Google David Gorski. Shatner finds anti-Gorski sites and discredits Gorski over Twitter, and then Shatner is attacked again. So this Slate article by Alan Leibowitz soon appeared and sums up the entire mess with these two statements. A crank website can capture the mind of a celebrity with 2.5 million followers and discredit one of the most reliable sites on the internet for shame. And the reliable sites on the internet he's talking about are science-based medicine. You can't understand the depth of the current chaos until you see William Shatner tweeting a site friendly to Health Ranger. And Health Ranger is also Mike Adams or Natural News. These are very discredited websites. So we have a problem. We have a big problem. This exchange not only sums up the problem with Shatner, but why when the majority of evidence is, that is on the side of reason and science, why are we having trouble getting the information we hold beyond the choir? So, you supported the March for Science? How many people went and were supported it? I was there too. Wasn't that great? It was so much fun. So it's fun to see everybody all dressed up. And in this picture, I took this, I'm in Monterey, County, Monterey area, Monterey County in California, which is, uh, we had our March for Science. And I took this photo because I am a professional portrait photographer. I love it. I mean, look at the woodpeckers. Aren't they, aren't they adorable? I mean, they're just so cute. Who, who else dressed up as a woodpecker? Everybody? Wow. Okay. And I mean, look at this little guy's socks over here. Aren't they cute? And he, with the purple hat, the pink hat. And he's just so excited to be in his first protest. We're getting the youth all jazzed up, you know. Come on, science. All right. So I took this photo. I uploaded it to Wikimedia Commons. And it's now resides on Wikipedia in an article. So that's one thing that we were able to do. But now what? We're all jazzed up. We're raring to go. But jazzed up to do what and to go where, right? So I'm going to offer you a solution, I hope. So I am Susan Gerbic. I am the leader and founder of the Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia project, better known as GSOW. I'll be using that acronym a lot because it's a lot less than uh, Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia. So GSOW. We are a Wikipedia editing team working to improve, rewrite, create, and support Wikipedia pages associated with scientific skepticism. We work on pages concerned with the paranormal, alternative med, science, the history of the skeptic community, and we have the backs of the people on the front lines, those people who are getting a lot of attacks. They are getting uh, doxxed, so they're getting ridiculed, they're at, at, uh, possibly losing their uh, freedoms and their um, livelihood and their jobs. So we are trying to have their backs to make sure that they're in, those Wikipedia pages are in great shape so that they can put their best foot forward so they can continue, continue doing the work that they need to be doing. We do this, GSOW does this by recruiting, training, and mentoring science-minded people all over the world. We advocate for better communication 
and give them a better outlet for their frustrations than arguing on social media with people who are not listening to what you are saying and they're not listening to the, reading the links you're giving them. I have news for you. They're not, the believers are not, don't care. You can argue with them all day long and they're not reading it. They're not hearing you. They're just, they're not there. So the work that the, I and my editors are doing on Wikipedia allows them to be better educators and to keep my editor's blood pressure down <laughs> and probably they'll have a better home life because they're not so angry and frustrated. So now to be fair, William Shatner might be a famous celebrity. Okay, yeah, he is a famous celebrity. But he is just some guy, right? He's a guy with over 2.5 million Twitter followers, but essentially he is just a guy. We can't expect him to understand the controversy of Autism Speaks. That's not his thing. He's not a scientist. He's just, he's just a guy, right? So let me see if I can figure out how to page down this thing here real quick. Okay. Um, there you go. Sorry. We need to do a, we, collectively we, and everybody who's watching, this is live streamed on Facebook and Periscope, and you guys and everybody else, we need to do a better job of leaving good information in places people can find written in languages people read and written for the non-academic. Okay. Shatner did a Google search for, for David Gorski and found only negative sites. We do not know why Shatner did not first go to Wikipedia as it was suggested in here. She says, I'm surprised that you didn't just go to the Wikipedia, which uh, has all the links to scientific papers. We don't know why he didn't go there. Possibly, he discredits Wikipedia. It has a reputation. Maybe he thinks that that's just not the place to go. Maybe he thinks the first views he gets are the ones that are the, are the accurate ones. Or possibly, as this Twitter person suggests, that because maybe William Shatner, I don't know, has anti-vax views and he's done past Google searches that support uh, anti-vax sites and that is why the, the search uh, results for David Gorski were at the top of the hit for that. So I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not a computer kind of person in that way, but I'm sure you all have your own opinion, and maybe somebody could look into Shatner and see if he is anti-vax, I don't know. What I do know is that David Gorski has a strong Wikipedia page, and it was created by the GSOW project in March 2013, and we maintain it, and that's how I know it's a good Wikipedia page. Some people were curious who David Gorski is, and they went and they found his Wikipedia page. These are the stat views for that period, and I don't know how well you can see this because it's light blue, but uh, since GSOW created this page in 2013, it's already received 63,750 page views. He averages about 100 page views a day, and that number is off because I wrote this slide about five days ago. So you can see, Here's his normal stat views, and then look, here's the page views on the day that the twits, the twits, <laughs> is that a word? Is that a word? It is now. That's the days that the stats were high. And now this isn't thousands, that's only 400 right there. And you can see it comes down here to 200 and 150, and it goes back to normal. And then he has some, some surges just because of the normal things he does. Maybe this is the day his blog comes out, or I don't know. But this isn't huge numbers. But it is a huge number for David Gorski. 400 page views, whoever's doing the math, is so many thousands times more percentage-wise or whatever than, than a normal view. But it's a lot, it is a start, it is what we can do. So some people were able to find that page. They were curious enough that they went from Twitter to the Wikipedia page, or that woman who put the Wikipedia page um, URL in that tweet, they might have possibly have clicked on that. So the goals of GSOW are many and grandiose, and maybe even idealistic. Not only are we attempting to rewrite Wikipedia concerning all these topics in all languages possible, which is probably thousands of pages, I don't even want to know because I'm afraid it would just really discourage me, but we're trying to do this, you know, you know in a huge way, and our goal is to grow our community. Not only the GSOW community, but the community at large. I really in, uh, support conferences and, and efforts to get our message out beyond the choir. But we also need to grow us, our people, the people watching, all those people who are interested in scientific skepticism. We need to find you. We need to motivate you. We need to train you. And we need to support you. We need to follow up. Not just the people, but the projects that are happening. 
Some people join GSOW and they move on to other projects. That happens, I'm fine with that. They meet other people who are like-minded, they learn about the community, they, they, they find a networking, and then sometimes they go on to other projects. I have lots of people who, are, who have done other things outside of GSOW. Some people stay with GSOW through the whole time that we're, that we're, we're working, and some do both. They're, they're also still podcasting and blogging and lecturing and writing books and articles, and they're also still with the GSOW. Once you finish your training, you know, you can do as you please. So most people stay involved in activism of some kind once they have, they have come to GSOW. Currently, I have a team of 87 editors. They are located in our secret cabal. It is called a secret cabal. And it's in a secret Facebook group. So if you're joining the GSOW, you have to be able to go on Facebook. It's just the way it is, because that's where we, we work. Sorry <laughs> for, the, for those few people. But we're going to look at another aspect of GSOW. How many people are aware of this clinic? Oh, that's a lot. Wow, OK, almost half the group. So. Thankfully, Bob Blaskowitz and others, including David Gorski, have brought this clinic to our attention, the Brzezinski Clinic. GSOW did not write this Wikipedia page, but it has contributed to it, and it helps to maintain it. And I should be clear, GSOW does not hold all the skeptics that exist on Wikipedia. Normal Wikipedia editors who follow Wikipedia rules are editing under the rules of skepticism, which is citation needed. And that citation needs to be a pretty darn good one if you're going to be making an unusual claim. Wikipedia would be conservapedia in a month if it was not for the awesome Wikipedia editors that exist outside of GSOW. They do a major lion's share of the work and the robots that are um, trolling Wikipedia all the time. The English Brzezinski Clinic page receives about 350 page views a day. The Brzezinski Clinic is in Houston, Texas, but it attracts people from all over the world. GSOW felt it needed to get this page translated into other languages, because that's part of our mission, is to make sure that Wikipedia pages are written in languages other than English so that people can read it and understand it in the language that they're most comfortable reading. So we translated it into Dutch, and this is, I think, the first page that we translated. And it has received, at the time I made this slide, 6,897 page views. And no, there will not be a test. You don't have to write these numbers down, but I'm just trying to give you a, a feeling of how many page views that gets. Almost 9, 000, uh, 7,000 page views. About 25 page views a day. We've also written it in German, and that has received a little over 5,000 page views so far. And then also Portuguese, because of course you would do the same. Um, and Portuguese has received about 4,000 page views. 4,000 page views of people going and looking up the Brzezinski Clinic in Portuguese? That's kind of interesting, right? And then we also decided to translate it to Italian. And I think it was more Bob Blaskowitz encouraged us to do this because of this guy. So shout this out if you know who this is. <laughs> the young people in the audience probably won't know who Fabio is, but. Fabio is a Brzezinski supporter. He is, he is a big supporter. He's a true believer. And when his sister was dying of stage four cancer, he brought her to the clinic where she died a few weeks later. She didn't get her antineoplastines. It was, she was already too far along. She was extremely dehydrated when they brought her in, and they basically gave her fluids and she lived a, a few weeks and that was it. So we felt that it's possible that he may be doing some kind of lectures or we didn't know what he might do in Italian, so we felt that we better get the Wikipedia page made in Italian just in case some, something for unforeseen happens. So my entire editing team, my entire editing team on Italian, which is a joke because I only have one person, <laughs> and uh, we've asked on podcasts and I've begged for the last two years, but we can't find any more Italian editors. And this is one woman, and her name is Raffaella, and I'm just gonna mention her really briefly because I want you to understand what are the type of people who join my project? So Raffaella is living in Italy. She has no skeptic groups near her. That she, There are skeptic groups in Italy, but they're not near her where she could get to. She was also working on her PhD in mathematics. So she's busy. She's got, she's got a full life, and, and she still decided she wanted to join the GSOW project because she really wanted to give back and do something. So she's been working for me, oh gosh, maybe it's been a couple years now. So she mostly translates. We never use Google Translate. We only use, uh, when we translate a page, we only do it in 
with a real uh, native speaker. So the Brzezinski page in Italian has already received almost 3,000 page views. And then Bob Blaskowitz had this other idea. He's, Bob Blaskowitz, by the way, is not on the GSOW team, but you know, he's a good friend and I have a, a, a interested in the Brzezinski um, clinic um, um, whole thing. So he suggested that maybe we should put it in Polish because Brzezinski's Polish, right? So I didn't have a Polish editor, and I do have one now, and it's Adam, and he was the first to sign up on the Facebook Live. Hi, Adam. So um, we do have a Polish editor, but at the time, we didn't. So what Bob Blaskowitz did is he found somebody who could translate the English page into Polish, and then one of my editors, Nathan Miller, who is in more or less in this area here, he, um, of Washington, D.C., Nathan went and translated the code and, and made this page live in Polish without speaking Polish. It's, it's quite an achievement. I think maybe he can speak a little German, but he just managed to do it because it was so important. And I've mentioned how many page views these other language page views have uh, other pages like 3,000, 5,000, 7,000 page views. Well, the Polish page is one of the most recent ones we've translated. It's already almost at 28,000 page views. So it's being accessed, and it's not just being accessed by just one or two random people. Because it's in Polish, it's really making a difference. This may or may not be one of the top page views that, uh, in Polish Wikipedia. I'm sure it's probably in the, maybe the top thousand. I don't know. I'm just making it up, but we're not recording this, right? Okay. <laughs> so we know with all these page views, many are probably not skeptics, but they're desperate families looking for help and they're going to fall into this clinic's clutches if they don't have good information. And hopefully some of the views are people going to the page and then going, oh, and then turning around and leaving and trying to find some real help for, them, for themselves. We don't know how, okay, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to add, we wanted to see how much of a page is actually being accessed. And there was one way we figured out to do this. Anybody know who Tyler Henry is? Okay, a couple of you guys. So this is Tyler Henry, and I'm kind of glad you don't know who he is, but he's been on my radar for a little over a year now. He's brand new to the world of psychic mediumship. In January of 2016, so what, about a year and a half ago, the E! Network, which I know you all follow, the E! Network, the Car Kim Kardashian and, and friends, you're, you're up to date on what's going on in their season, right? So they almost just picked him up from a psychic shop and gave him a reality show. That's, that's about what happened. There are a lot of people, oh, oh, and I should mention, it has just hit its third season. I think yesterday was season three. Believe it or not, he's still in business. Outside of G the GSOW project, there are a lot of people who know me for the other activism I do, and they would be absolutely shocked to learn that I run a Wikipedia editing group. I specialize in researching and writing about people we call grief vampires. And I've done several stings with these people along with other friends of mine. Um, and you can read all about the other work I do by Googling my name, Susan Gerbic, and then add the word psychic, and you should be able to find all the different stings I've done. Operation Bumblebee, Operation Ice Cream Cone. This is Operation Tater Tot. And we have a new one that's going to be coming out hopefully in the next few months. It's called Operation uh, Pizza Roll. So you'll be able to do that. Now I put this picture up here because we all love Dr. Phil, don't we? What a sweetheart. He's... I've been told, and I know people who's been on his show, he's the biggest skeptic of them all. Did you know that? We've been told that so many times, that he is the biggest skeptic, but if he just skeptically putting his arm around him, you know, right, right. Uh -huh. So I've written at least six articles about Tyler Henry for the Skeptical Inquirer, and as his chief critic, I also have a, well, I also have a Wikipedia page, and because I have a Wikipedia page and because I'm his chief critic, then the articles I write, which are being released in a noteworthy place, which is Skeptical Inquirer um, online, my articles I write can go onto his Wikipedia page. Awesome. So here's the page views for the Tyler Henry page. Now remember, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out something. We're trying to figure out, are people looking at the Wikipedia page and following the links and going somewhere else? So these shows, this shows a few peaks which all co correspond to the airing of his, of his uh, show. If you can see down here at the end, huge spikes. This is whatever the E Network was really marketing him. He just started January of 2016. I should also mention we did not write the Wikipedia page for Tyler Henry. 
Somebody else did, and they've been adding criticism on. And then as we go up here, this is season two. You can see all these spikes, right? And then if we go down here, you can see uh, a little bit more. And this probably is where they started promoting him for season three on the E! Network. And this guy, at the time I wrote this, uh, published this slide, maybe five days ago, he's already at 850,000 page views. That's a lot of page views, right? But keep in mind that if this man could do what he says he does, communicate with the dead, he'd be getting over 850 page views a day, right? We'd also be burning all textbooks because we would have to rewrite physics and so on. So now this is the Wikipedia page for Susan Kerbeck. I'm going to talk in the third person, which is a little odd. So this is the exact same time frame that the Tyler Henry page is. And you can see these massive peaks right here. And you can see another set of peaks and then other massive peaks right here. So you can kind of see. Now let's put those two pages together. Now this is logarithmic, so that there's, so this is thousands of page views. This is hundreds of page views. Again, I'm not so sure how well you guys can see that with the light coloring, but this is a site I use and they color it and, and that, those colors. So you can see these peaks and lows are exactly pretty much the same. It's not pareidolia. I'm sure you would be able to tell it. But you can see there's two little spots right here that correspond to two little spots right there, two little spots here. Two. It's, they're going from one page to the other. It's obvious that they are doing so. Of course, they're not going to the scale that we'd like them to do, the 10,000s and stuff like that. But they are accessing the Tyler Henry page. They're probably watching TV and they're saying, Hmm, who's this guy who's talking to the dead? He, I've never heard of Tyler Henry. They're Googling him and they're coming up with Wikipedia because it's one of the first views you're going to get is you're going to hit the link to Wikipedia. And then once they're on the Wikipedia page, they're looking at it. And there's a lot of criticism on his Wikipedia page. And, but my name is mentioned in the lead, which is the top part. So that's probably why they're, mine's getting more, more um, views than other people who are also uh, notable, like Mark Edward and different people like that. If you go down further, you'll see that in the criticism section, because I know you're all going to go Google uh, Tyler Henry to go read about him, um, you'll see there's a lot of good criticism in there that's justified being there. Now, I don't know, has anybody looked at this? Because you guys are stat people, I'm sure. You're skeptics. You like numbers. Has anybody noticed anything odd with the Susan Gerbic's views? Yeah. What do you see, Chip? There are a couple of dips there. There's dips, yeah. Now, wow. Look, so you can see down here, there's this big dip here. It doesn't correspond here. Yeah, Chip, of course, would notice these stats. And here's another one here. And there's not a correspondence right there. And is there another one? No, this is, this is normal. It corresponds to there. So what would cause that to happen? Because the Wikipedia page for Tyler Henry is still working and functioning and everything's fine. And the Susan Gerbic page is still functioning. But what would cause the views to go down? Does anybody have some ideas? You took your links off. That's right. Very good. Somebody went in and erased the entire criticism section for Tyler Henry. Okay? And then when it's pointed out and it's found, it was added back in. We, in a way, it's a good thing that it, that happened because I can use the slide as evidence that this is what's going on. When the criticism is removed from the Tyler Henry page, then they're not getting criticism because there's no criticism to get and they would have received criticism. They would have been able to find that. And then, of course, of course they'd be able to go to the citations and follow the links and see what I've actually written, the articles themselves, and the other people on the page. So this is a fascinating, kind of like a little double blind kind of thing, I guess, where it, would, it shows you that what happens when, the, when, this, when it works out like that. So that's a very interesting little thing. Now we have, we know that it was... How long did it take? Oh, this is maybe uh, five days. No, no, no. How long did it take for you to get it back on? After seconds. It off? Seconds. The robot would do it in seconds. Where a human being would go, click, click and then make a note. We know it was a believer. We know it was a supporter because every edit on Wikipedia is an edit that you can see. It's transparent. You can see every edit and there's no conspiracy. It is, uh, it is totally out there, right? So we can see that the supporter had written something like, oh, you can't have criticism on a living person's page. You're like, oh yeah, you can. <laughs> So yes, we can. If it's from a notable source, you can't put gossip and you can't put blogs and stuff like that. But if it's coming from a notable source that's, that's in a, uh, a place that's notable, you sure can. So the criticism was taken out and added back in. And, and this is maybe a week. This is maybe, I don't know, three, two or three days, something like that. So it wasn't very long. But that was very interesting. 
So I have another story that I want to show you. So in August 2016, the U.S. swim team oh, showed up with cupping marks all over their bodies, right? The hickey things, the circular. Okay, that's my hickey sound. Okay. This led to the media and the public frantically wanting to learn more. The media called in cupping practitioners who, who came in and demonstrated how cupping works. People started looking for information and many found the Wikipedia page. Essentially the lead before the GSOW project got involved, again this is the lead and this is what most people read and then they leave. They might look at this and they might look at this and most people that's all they read. So it's a really important that this and this is in terrific shape. So when, before we got involved, which is right out of the beginning, right at the very beginning, the Wikipedia page could be, you could have read it and it would have said basically, cupping is old and it works. <laughs> that was pretty much summing up what used to be there. So I and other Wikipedia editors, we got wind of what was going on because we started seeing the media come through on our social media. And we turned around and we said, oh no, fix this. So we got to, as far as getting the cupping therapy uh, lead taken care of. And now, after, you know, it's been a year almost, if you were to read it and you were to condense it down to what it actually says, it says something like, it's old, it does not work, and it might harm you. So here's some of the page view stats during that time. So we're talking thousands now, right? So this is, this is the normal page views for the Wikipedia page. They normally get about 1,500 page views a day. A day, people, a day. Wow. So. We got work to do. This is, this is one day, 106,000 page views. One day. And this is when the Olympics are happening, August. August 6th, 7th, right around there. So, the, so here's these people on TV. Here's these swimmers with these giant circle hickeys on them. And the media is going, oh, we got to call in somebody. We need, we, we, oh my gosh, scramble, scramble, scramble. And people are Googling cupping? What the heck is that? And, they're all going to Wikipedia. Well, maybe not all of them, but there's an awful lot. And you can see as these stats go down a little bit each time. So it's probably, oh, I don't know, 200,000, maybe over this little week, week and a half time. So it's an awful lot of people who are looking at these on these page views. Well, all right, insert GSOW. I'm trying to make sure that we get really good information on Wikipedia pages. So one of the things that I did is I went and I found people who are notable in our community who have written really good articles about cupping, very good citations, and I went and I included them in the lead of the page because I didn't have a lot of time and I just included them in the lead of the page and eventually it got moved to the body of the page which is probably where it should have been in the first place and that's where they reside right now. If you look at the cupping therapy Wikipedia page you'll find that we've mentioned a lot of different people in the lead who should be there. They're experts in this field of pseudoscience and uh, medical pseudoscience more or less. One of the people that you may know is Harriet Hall and there's all sorts of other different kinds of people and you can look at that when you have time. All the people we put in there are people who have really well written Wikipedia pages and you know how I know that. We wrote those pages, right? One of the things that I've been thinking of for quite a while is that, remember I said that I want to support people who are doing good work and I want to support people who are, who are um, um, in our community so that they can do a better job. So what I wanted to do is I want those people to be on the page so that when something like that happens, the media goes, you know, the media is losing money we, or whatever, they're, you know, they, they're not able to do the research, they're cutting back. So if they were to go to the Wikipedia page, because you know they're going to, because they don't know what it is either, and they found experts on that page who have written great readable articles, they could look at that and they could say, hey, Harriet Hall, this one's local to us. Let's call her. Let's get her in the media. Let's get her on the camera. And they could see somebody like Harriet Hall has done other stuff in the past. And they can see that she has, uh, she's a well-spoken person and she's able to, you know, she's not a nut, right? So they, <laughs> they would be able to say, let's call her. And then we also put scattered, we put other people on there from other places around the world, somebody from New Zealand, somebody from Australia, a couple people from, from England, so that the media all over the world would be able to call in somebody in their time zone, um, you know, that kind of thing. So we're kind of thinking that way. 
Now, we didn't get there completely in time. We got close, but we, we, we now are prepared. But the time, I, I'm not psychic. I didn't know that cupping was going to be a thing that day. But <sighs> that, that's how you know I'm not psychic. And Tyler t wasn't in the, anyway. So, um, <laughs> so what we did is we, we tried to get the, those people's pages in great, it, the pages already existed in great shape, all the people we put up there. So that was already done. But now, in case the celebrities come back and start bringing more media attention, which obviously it's already starting, somebody's out there getting cupping and posting on Instagram. And so this is, this is a graph, again, it's light colored, sorry. This is, again, hundreds, not thousands, which we sure as heck would like. But these are four people that I mentioned, Harriet Hall, Simon Singh, Mark Crispit, and Edward Ernst. Four people in our community, four people that we've worked on their Wikipedia pages, and I know the Wikipedia pages are reputable and people could look at them and go, good job, this is somebody who's sane and somebody who's, who's uh, well-spoken and well-written and has credentials to get on TV. And you can see the same spike over and over. This is Simon Singh, the light green, and he he's, um, has uh, other reasons why his Wikipedia page views would be high. He hits about 200 page views a day. And then some of these others, they're in the hundreds or less, 50 and so on. So, but the same spike. So we know that during that window of time that we had the information and people were interested in cupping, some people were going over and looking at these pages. Hopefully the media will be the ones that are hitting on that and then and trying to find them to come in and do a, a you know, a interview or at least getting their articles for criticism and being able to, to do that. So it's not the thousands we'd like, but at least it's something. So we have evidence on our side, but unless we can find creative ways to get this information in places where people will find it and in languages they understand, then we're always going to be fighting against fake news and celebrities on Twitter. We, again, we as a collective, we are all a very small percentage of the population that cares about this kind of thing. We need a bigger proportion to step up in our communities. So doing GSOW training is a big task. I have one of my editors here, Pete, wait, Dad. So he, he'll be happy to answer any questions I don't. Um, he's one of my, uh, just recently finished training. And um, we need a bigger proportion of people to step up because doing the training is a, a task. It's self-paced. It's all online, and you all would receive a personal trainer to guide you through every step. But once you finish training, which can take weeks or months, then we're going to expect you to do some work. So it's, it's, it is something that uh, does take some time and is a commitment. And I'm going to point this out really quickly before I finish. This is George Robb. This is a project that you can do and help us with. It has nothing to do with uh, the skepticism movement necessarily. You don't have to join the GSOW project. This is an info box. Right? What a lot of Wikipedia pages miss are great photos. And another thing that we specialize in is audio. And this is just them speaking, saying, my name is George Robb. I'm known for this famous, this, this is why I'm known for this. Some people tell jokes. Some people um, do quotes. But we like to get audio to put on the Wikipedia page so you can hear them pronounce their name. You can hear them speak. And it's kind of fun. So everybody here has probably a cell phone that is enough quality to get that audio and to get a photo. And I took that picture of him in January at a conference in California, LA. But we need at least that. So if you know of somebody who has a Wikipedia page that needs a nice current picture or audio, do it. Take it. It doesn't have to be the highest resolution ever. And then I can help you, just email me and I'll help you upload it. And that is, this goes not just for the skeptics in our world, but also for the artists, the writers, the, the politicians. You're in DC after all. But anyway, there's all kinds of places you can get this information. So if you do know of other people who have pages that need help, we're happy to help because we're all about trying to improve Wikipedia as a whole. I'm just focused mostly on the scientific skepticism but we really do want to improve Wikipedia pages all over. So we've been collecting audio for a long time. We're a little bit over 100 uploads. We take people at conferences. We chase them into corners, into quiet rooms. And we're, OK, two minutes. I just need your audio right there. And this is a page if you're interested in, you can find. It's got all kinds of different people's voices telling, telling their little story. And we have them, if they speak more than one language, we tell them to, to actually do it. This is Dutch, and this is English for the same person. Um, here's another person in Dutch. Here's um, another Dutch one, because I have a, a, a Dutch 
person who's just really into this, and I also have a, a Hungarian too, but it's kind of fun. In conclusion, yay. GSOW is making a difference. We are achieving our goals. We are doing great work, but we're such a tiny little group, 87, 88 people in the thousands of pages that need to be done. I need help, right? So obviously I'm here to recruit you, but, <laughs> but it is the most popular website in, well, it's the 10th most popular website in the world. We are trying to get those noteworthy citations onto a free and popular website written in languages other than English, because it's too important. We can't just concentrate on English. There's whole worlds of people out there who don't speak English or who would rather read the article in their native language. We're also trying to get it written in a non-academic style. You don't have to be an expert. In fact, we like people who are not experts to, to work on a lot of the pages, because then we know the page is going to be in, written in a way that anybody could read it. We're growing our GSOW activism community. I still need editors, but we are still growing. But what I'm really worried about, what I'm really concerned about, is the community outside of GSOW. The level of activism is low, with none or lowly defined goals and no way to measure our success. And this is just my opinion, but I think that we're not growing. The skeptic community is dying. I think we're starting to die. We, not this group necessarily, because you, you guys are doing great. You're awesome. I, meetups, lectures, all this. You're videotaping it and you have an active YouTube channel and you have an active site. That is not normal, you guys. This is not normal. I'm on every Facebook group you can imagine that's skeptic related. You guys are doing awesome. Very few are doing what you're doing. I'm on almost every Facebook group that I can find that has to do with skepticism of any kind and they are not, they're, they're not maintaining their websites if they have a website and they're not maintaining their YouTube channels. You look at their sites and they're like a year or two out of date. It's, it's, they're not maintaining it. They're not getting the content out there. You attend conferences or whatever and they're filming it and then they go home and the video is somewhere. Nobody uploads it. So we're not even growing ourselves. You know, it's great if you got 200 people in a room, like today. You, <laughs> just kidding. But um, if you've got a lot of people in a room, I'm educating you, but let's get beyond. We've got to get the other people excited and who couldn't attend. They need, to, they need to learn, too. The other problem is, and this is obviously not your guys' problem either, but you know, I'm talking to a light, larger audience right now, one or two people are doing all the work. When those people burn out, and they will, the group fails. So Facebooks are turning, Facebook groups are turning into repository of people sharing memes and articles, and there's no original content. That's what you're seeing on these pages. You can see it over and over. And the drama that ripped up our community in 2012 and 2013, that may be the problem. Many people left in disgust, and I cannot blame them. It's enough to fight against non-science nonsense, but to pit peer against peer was too much for a lot of people. And I'm here to tell you it's over. We, those people who were causing the most problems, they have marginalized themselves into a corner. Some people would say they're in safe spaces now and they're starting to eat their own. We need to heal, and all the people listening, we need to heal and we need to come together. Those that are left over, we need to come together and we need to heal and build bridges. We, if you're fortunate enough not to know what I'm talking about, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Thank your lucky stars, okay? But we're human and Twitter still exists, so there's still just a matter of time before we can find a new way to be offended and let's hope we've learned our lesson. Remember the lecture is not over until the video is uploaded and shared. The content of the conference is not over until you have looked at the survey and you've learned from it and you've picked the next dates. Funding needs to be found, but throwing money at a problem never works, especially if there's no way of measuring a success. We need people to step up sponsor scholarships for others to attend conferences, maintain the website, take the videos off the hard drive, and upload it. It's not that hard. We can't merely march for science and call it a win. We need to create, organize, motivate, and fund the projects and people that are doing the work. Let our scientists get back to doing what they best do and they love. We need to have their backs and we need to own this. And that's it. All right, so here's the fun part. Let's, let me just find this website. I was going to show you a couple numbers just, just really quick before we get to Q&A. This is a site that was created uh, after one of the TAMs that I attended. 
I have a friend who is a, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who help GSOW that are not GSOW editors. I have a, a large group of people who have done amazing things for our project that make us work, uploading photos and doing software things for us. I wanted to be able to measure success, right? One of my friends, Jay Diamond, said, Susan, wonderful, what are you guys doing? How do you know if you're doing anything? It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know. So Jay talked me into trying to figure it out. So I talked to a man, his name is, he's the data skeptic. So he created this for me. We went back and forth, him and I just like, okay. I, I'm not a tech person, so I didn't really know what I could do. So I kept asking him, Kyle, Kyle Polish, thank you. Data skeptic, he has a podcast, check him out. If you like stats, Chip, this is this podcast you wanna look at. So we created a site, this is private, so you guys are looking at something that's kind of cool. Um, and we wanted to look at just the pages that GSOW has written extensively or completely rewritten, not just made a few changes to, because that, it, it would be millions and millions and millions of page views if we were just look at things, because we make edits all the time that are small paragraphs, rewriting, we do stuff all the time. But as of this, last time this was done, which was probably last night, the GSOW project has been involved in creating or completely rewriting pages that have had 10,887,034 page views. That is a hell of a lot. That's more than a podcast is gonna get. We, and these aren't all skeptics. These are people who are probably not uh, interested in the, you know, this is outside the choir. And I'm just gonna do a couple of these real quick so we can go to Q&A real quick. So you can see that I have it broken down into our editors. I have it broken down into different topics. We have astronomy. We've written 32 pages that are associated with astronomy because a lot of people are into it. Atheists, 42. Books, 20. Cryptids. CSI fellows, we have 60. We have TAM, people who've spoken at TAM, we've written 86 pages. Um, medical stuff, 24. The vaccine, we spent six months working on things that had to do with vaccinations. We've written 12 pages, six on UFOs. Um, and then we have other things here too. I've broken it down into regions, but languages. This Italian editor I was talking about, Raffaella, she's at 12 pages she's created in between her getting her PhD and now she's a teacher. You know, um, we've got four pages written in Hungarian, three in German, two in French. Dutch, we've got 80. We have one in Arabic. That's awesome. We don't have an Arabic uh, editor anymore. 10 in Russian, Portuguese is 13, 16, Polish is two, and Spanish is seven. So we've done some amazing things, and this is only the beginning for us. I've, I've just retired in October, so I'm just barely starting out. Um, even though we've been, I've been editing, we've kind of been doing this for about seven or eight years now. But, um, so we are making a lot of difference in, in the world, and, and the farther we grow, the more we can go do, the more we can see. Here's Pete over here. You've created two pages, right? One of them, you guys would love, is called Hell's, what is it? Hell's, Hell's Angel? Angel? Hell's Angel. Anybody know what Hell's Angel is? Not the biker group. <laughs> it's, a, it's a movie, right, by Christopher Hitchens that, that criticizes um, Mother Teresa. <laughs> and that was a fun page. We all were involved. <laughs> Every time somebody writes a page, we all are in, involved. What was the second page you did? Oh, uh, Jeff Wise, he's a, uh, a science writer for uh, uh, very mainstream publications. Right. So now once you're training, the very end of training, you have to rewrite a page. That's part of your training. And that's when you did Hell's Angel. Hell's Angels? Hell's Angel. Hell's Angel. Yeah, because the spelling's cut off. Yeah, the other's a motorcycle group. <laughs> And then once you leave training, you can do anything you want. Some people pick something off a, a, a list of people we've got to get done. Some people have a favorite hobby or topic that they want to work on. Some people will try and, um, and why did you pick WISE? I just went down the list and picked one. So you picked one off the list. I, so, I, I didn't know anything about them and said, well. I'll that's a more interesting thing, to so. find somebody who's not on there. Okay, so questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and has Wikipedia ever considered doing some kind of usability testing where you have somebody sit in front of your website and try to do some <coughs> editing, someone who's never tried it before, just to see? You shouldn't have to do a workshop to I be able to edit an article on Wikipedia. Well, right? You should be able to click on a button that says edit, which you can, and then the thing comes up and you start you know, doing your editing, but it's really tough to do. 
It's really, really tough. That's why you must need months to be trained. Well, there are, there are, there. They did have an edit source that was. Uh, it was an edit. Oh God, I'm trying to think of what it is. It's a uh, was a way of doing. It looked like you were editing a word document. So it came up a word document where you just go in and you insert, and it was much easier. Some people still use that. I don't use it. I was I learned a different way with the code. So I think the there code, are yeah, I mean, it's the crazy. code is crazy. It's, it's like crazy. HTML. It's but once you get it, it's it's no. to me I don't really have a problem with it now. So after you edit a page, do you have an internal review process of the page before it's made live? Right, that's a great question. So what we do is we have a secret cabal on Facebook. So what we do is we try to create anything that's extensively done, a long page, not just like a small edit. We will try to make a user page in something called a sandbox, and we take the user page and we put it in the secret cabal, and the editor will say, I'm almost done with this, let's, let's go at it. And then the other editors who are interested, they'll go in and they'll rip it apart. And it's usually minor things like misspellings, grammar, they don't feel that the sentence flows well, um, and then we have a lot of eyes looking at it. And then once we've got that done, people are saying, well, I found a citation over here, or I found this. Then we'll make it live. And then once it's live, anybody on Wikipedia can edit it. And that, it's totally encouraged. We don't own the page. I don't want anybody to think we own a page. We usually walk away from the page because we've got so much to do. But it's inevitably, after all these people have looked at it, we put it up, something's misspelled. It's always <laughs> so we try to make sure it is. And we are our worst critics. We will, we're really after that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because um, Wikipedia has, you know, they're kind of really insistent about citations for stuff. Um, one, there's a lot of citations that you might want to use that are paywall, so people cannot necessarily get to right. see the evidence there. The other issue is there's a lot of stuff, especially, uh, I deal with a lot of astronomy issues. I'm kind of curious as to what you got in there. Oh, I'll there. show you. Okay. Um, but, where if you've done like your own analysis or something like of a problem and you want to be able to post that, but there's the, you you have no citation because there's just no right. You're doing primary. There's no, there's no there's no peer reviewed journal about screw ups that people make that support pseudoscience. Um, so it becomes a little bit trickier to do that. Um, so I'm just wondering how that's. I mean, there I, you can try to find. Op, you know, openly at open access journals for stuff, but it, it, the coverage is right. not that great. Well, we can use pay, paywall journals. We hate doing that, but we can if we really have to. Um, and I think they'll put in the citation, this is behind a paywall. Yeah. Um, we can, and we have done, asked to have things released, especially if it's older. Okay. You can have, you can say, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to work on a Wikipedia page and the only article we can find on this is behind this paywall. Can you release it? And a lot of people will, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people will do it uh, if you ask nicely and, and tell them that it'll get more views. And um, also, you can't do original research. So you can't yourself, unless you're notable, you can't put anything up. Everything has to be behind, it has to be secondary source. And it's really important that we, we follow those rules because we have to make sure that you know, the rules apply to skeptics is the same as they apply to the pseudoscience world. We can't expect them to abide by a certain set of rules that we won't uh, abide by. So we can't allow them to put up original research or something that's not well researched. So we have to, be, we have to make sure we follow the rules correctly. Yes, sir? Once you've edited a page, do you get a notification if there have been subsequent edits? That's a good question. So what we do is in the upper right-hand corner of every Wikipedia page, there's a star. It's white. It's clear. And if you click on that star and you're logged into a Wikipedia account, it turns blue. And that just means that it's added that page to a watch list. So that anytime you sign on to Wikipedia, you'll go to a little area that says watch list. And you click on it, and it'll tell you every change that's been made to every page that's on your watch list. They're not going to send you an email saying somebody changed something. And, but you can look at that, and depending on how many pages are on your watch list, you know, you could go through it in a couple minutes. And you could look and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Revert, you know. So you can do that. So you can, so that's how Wikipedia works is by thousands of people having things on watch lists and things like that so that they can, they can, tell if something's changed, like when the Susan Gerbic criticism, all the criticism was removed from Tyler Henry's page, somebody said, oh wait, what's going on? It took a few days in some cases to, for somebody to notice that. More questions? Yes? What happens when you get to the floor where you 
So if you change something, revert it, it's reverted back, it's reverted back. Okay, I get this question a lot. So um, I'm going to expand on that a little bit because I probably somebody else under, um, has a bigger question. So anybody can edit Wikipedia. You do not have to be even logged in. So when somebody makes a change to Wikipedia, somebody can come in and edit and take out what you said. They could take it out and change it. It just takes two clicks, click, click. Somebody else can come back in and edit it back in. And then you have something called an edit war. Well, the rules of Wikipedia are, are the rules I wish we would live by in society because it's like uh, be bold, but also assume good faith. And we try really hard not to be involved in anything called a wet editing war. I think there's a, there's a rule like you're not supposed to go more than three. But on every Wikipedia page, it's a little button that says talk. And anybody can look at it. You don't have to be logged in. You don't have to have an account. If you look at the talk page, that is a conversation that editors are having with each other about the page construction. So what usually happens if somebody reverts something and somebody tries to revert it back, somebody will say, go to talk. We need to talk about it. And then you'll see that they're having a discussion about why this is so important to you or why that is. So really, at least in my world, in the GSOW world, we don't have very many editing wars. My editors are trained to back off. If it is a really big deal, there's, nothing, there's no reason to lose your sleep on it. There's no reason to have your blood pressure um, raised. We walk away. There's so much else to be done. So if there's an edit war going on, walk away. Maybe come back in a month or so, and it's probably taken care of. Or maybe they have a really good point why it really shouldn't be there. So you know, we try to be respectful and be adults about it. This isn't Twitter. So, um, so the, uh, that happens. And the other question I get, I'm just going to expand and pretend you asked me this question because I'm psychic. I, I knew you were asking it. That um, we don't get a lot of paranormal people coming in and taking things out. It really doesn't happen that much. The most vandalism that's happening on Wikipedia are people who have, are like 13-year-old troll kind of people that are going and writing swear words on pages and stuff like that. That's the most vandalism most people see. But for the most part, we really see very little paranormal people who are going in and challenging it, like the Tyler Henry thing. That's pretty unusual. And they don't really understand the words evidence and what that means necessarily. And so they're not usually great Wikipedia editors uh, because they don't follow the rules like we do. They think you know somebody having a big Twitter following is actually evidence of something. And it's like, no, that isn't. So um, we, do, we don't really have a lot of problem. And then when GSOW puts out a page, it's in such, usually such good shape that it's not much to challenge on a page. More questions? Does GSOW have access to paywall sites? Because sometimes they have the paywall sites have the best. I have several people on my team that are librarians or are married to librarians. And, and apparently librarians <laughs> love my project. They absolutely love the project. I, have, I know I can think of one woman right off the top of my, well, I, one's a librarian. She's just really into it. And um, another one, her, her, her spouse is a librarian, and she comes home with a project. And he's like, what do you got? What do you got? What are you going to do? And he'll go, and he's, he's like at work you know, the next day. And he gives her all the sites, and he sends them to her. And she's like, look what I found. You know? <laughs> so we do have access to it just because if there's a lot of people in our group that are professors or in students in college, and they have access to LexisNexis and all the other stuff. So yeah. So when I'm training somebody, I tell them, you try to find all the sites you possibly can. And then whenever they start to fail at finding anything new, then they post in the secret cabal. They'll say, all right, I'm done. I can't find anything. And usually there's you know, 10 or 20 more sites somebody will find for them. And then I just want them to attempt to try it first because they're training. And I want them to, to find out how it works. And, then, and we learn from each other. We're constantly learning. I'm probably one of the least um, at, skilled editor on Wikipedia, which is, I don't know why I'm doing all the lecturing, but I am the least because, uh, skilled because they all surpass me. They start out not knowing how to edit Wikipedia. Some of them are computer people, but a lot of them are just barely just, they can use computers, but that's it. They can barely use Facebook, and they, and they work through it. And then they, they outsource me. And I, I want to just plug this since I'm thinking of it. I've got all these editors down here, and we, we don't really compete with each other about how much page views we have, but we, we kind of, it's kind of a game. The person who has the most page views um, is Nathan Miller, and he's a DC person who should be here. But Nathan Miller um, rewrote the Wikipedia page that gets us the most page views. Any guess what that would be? 
No, it's spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> so Nathan, I've written a lot of pages. I've written 40 something pages. I don't know, I've, I'm done off the screen. But Nathan's only written 10 and, and he just always beats me and it just gets on my nerves. So I have to keep trying to make more because he's getting, every time he gets a, the spontaneous human combustion page, he gets a page view. Then, it's, it's, it's over a million page views for spontaneous human combustion. I assure you, as somebody is my witness, people are still interested in the pseudoscience. They are fascinated with this stuff. The things that you would never think anybody cared about, I promise you, they are still accessing them on Wikipedia because they are fascinated with Bigfoot and chupacabras and, and vampires and UFO stuff and ghosts and all. It's, it's a living, breathing community. They're fascinated by it. And I can prove it because I know how many page views these pages are getting. So, you know, it's still a vibrant community that we need people to help us out because we got a lot of work to do. How did you get involved in this project? So I was on a, I've been involved in the skeptic community for a while. I was a longtime reader of the, of the uh, Skeptical Inquirer magazine. I was a member of the JREF forum back in the day and it was a community, it was before Facebook, and I was really looking for some way of getting involved. So the JREF used to have, the, that's the James Randi Educational Foundation, it used to have cruises, and it just so happened that I was at a point in my life where I could had enough on my credit card that I could go. So I would charge it on my credit card. So I went on a cruise, and I found, you know, I started attending events, and I felt like I found my community. But I didn't have any way of getting, giving back. I was just a person who sat in the audience who just read the books, listened to the podcast or whatever. I didn't have any activism. I knew I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what it was. And I went on a cruise to the Caribbean, and Tim Farley, who has, Tim Farley has the website, whatstheharm.net. He's a tech kind of guy, has great ideas. Um, and then I, I listened to what he's talking about, and he kinda, I kind of just took over the idea that he said we should be editing Wikipedia, and here's why. And he explained it. And he gave us some code stuff and some instructions, and I didn't understand it. And I just fell into it after a few months. I started editing Wikipedia, made a zillion mistakes, and then Facebook started. So I went onto Facebook and I said, I just edited this Wikipedia page. I'm so proud of myself. And then people who I didn't know started coming in and saying, Really? What did you do? How'd you do that? What are you going to do next? And then, so I said, Oh, well, okay, I was going to go over here and do this. So then what happened is, Somebody said, well, maybe you should start a team. And then somebody said, would you like to speak at our skeptic camp or our conference? And you're like, oh. And then I, got, uh, I did a paper presentation at TAM 9 from Outer Space. And I had to, I mean, they are just like, you got to do 15 minutes and it has to be blah, 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 like this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to come up with a name and all these things. And so and it just blew up from there because everybody's been, and I've been all over the world. And I'm going all over the world. I've, I've lectured all over and I've got more more coming up. It's apparently people are interested in activism. All right?